Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. And by Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting. Connecting new money with old money since 2018. And by Change Now, a limitless crypto exchange. Cake Wallet, Sweetwater Digital, and Change Now are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever by typing in monerotalk.crypto in your Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews cryptographers Aram Jevanyan and Sarang Northup about their recently published proposal of the Lalanta Spark Protocol. The three discussed the development of the proposal, how it was funded by the privacy coin project Firo and the benefit of competing cryptos trying to solve similar problems, the benefits it potentially could provide to Monero if adopted, and the general privacy coin space. Monero Talk starts now. Okay, Aaron, Aaron, this is, this is, this is too many A's, too many A's, and yeah. uh, thanks for coming on, guys. Hi. Great, Hi. appreciate it. So, um, well, we'll to Spark. I think we yeah. spoke about, Aaron, I, I met you, I think it was like two years ago at uh, DEF CON, right? Yeah, in Vegas. In Vegas, that's when I think I had first, I think maybe even heard about Lantis at the time right. um so it's it's been a while since aaron obviously i know you i know you better as sarang i'm not used to even calling you aaron it, you mind if i still call you sarang or, or yes uh yeah go for it Why not? <laughs> um so you guys teamed up to now i guess work on the Lantis together and it, it's turned into the Lantis spark before we get into it if you can each give a brief intro of yourselves, just so people understand the caliber of person we're, we're speaking to right now. So, uh, Aram, if you want, if you want to go ahead first and give a little bit, a little background on yourself. Aram or Aram? Aram. Uh, okay. Okay. Thanks, Luke, for having me today doing this show. So, I am Aram Jivanyan. I am cryptography advisor at Fero, which is a privacy cryptocurrency. And I'm the author of Lelantus Protocol, which is now deployed by Fero, which now powers Fero's network. And also co-author of Lelantus Spark, the new upgrade of that protocol that we have co-authored and worked together with Aaron. Okay. Aaron, you want to... Uh, yeah, hello, I'm Aaron. Um, I work um, as a cryptographer for Cypherstack um, and do contract work for Firo. Um, and um, previously, I collaborated with Aram um, on you know some on some initial work relating to improvements around Volantis, um, and now have helped him to develop Volantis Spark, um, development of which is still ongoing. But we're excited to talk about. Development's still ongoing. So, what stage are we currently at then? Because I know you guys recently issued uh, a proposal on it. So that's it's it's not finalized yet. How would you how would you explain it? How would you describe that? Yeah. So, I mean, the idea is that um, you know the protocol itself, um, a description of how it works and its cryptography and the security around which it's defined more formally. Um, that appears in a preprint um, that we put out onto. Um, one of the common preprint archives. Um, to be clear, like preprints aren't peer reviewed yet. So, you know, when you think preprint, just think like technical PDF someone posted on the internet. Um, and, you know, and, and we can talk later about in the meantime, like we still have been updating that as we, as we go along. Um, that preprint, a version of it is still under consideration um, for peer review um, for a particular inclusion at a particular conference. 
Um, and so at that point, like that could potentially give more, um, I guess, more confidence in its correctness. Um, and then additionally, of course, you know, if any other external reviews or audits are done on the math, that's good. It can provide increased confidence, um, you know, even further. Um, in the meantime, we worked out some some very basic, just kind of proof of concept code. Um, it isn't really suitable for deployment. That code um, at this point, um, nor is it really good for performance testing. More for just like iterating on some ideas, you know, and figuring out how one might transfer the um, ideas and the math and the algorithms into code eventually. So. A lot of the core functionality is there, but you know there's still some stuff around addressing and multi-signature operations that we really want to make sure that we that we kind of design as best we can from the start. Mm. And also working on particular cryptography features, right? Which is the diversified addresses. Okay. Um, so obviously Monero talk, so we like to talk about things in terms of Monero. Could you guys kind of describe, if you want to each take a shot out of it, or if one of you wants to jump up and describe it, um, how this will realistically affect Monero? What, what's, what's, what is the effect going to be on Monero if Monero were to implement Lantis Spark? Oh, I should, and I should take this. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, you know, I know that um, folks in the Monero communities have been interested in, um, you know, protocol upgrades over time. Um, Triptych, which is um, another um, kind of other proven system slash protocol that I had worked on previously, I know was of interest to a lot of folks, but had a lot of limitations, particularly around things like multi-signature constructions. Um, and so in the meantime, there had been research done on, um, you know, other approaches that might try to fix this. We'll add to Spark is one of them. Um, Seraphis is another similar construction that's being worked on um, independently by someone else. Um, and they, they, they share a lot of similarities, um, kind of in like kind of the, the base modular design of, of how they work. Um, so it, in theory, could be possible, you know, to do a Monero protocol upgrade. Um, that would support either one of these. Um, the downside is that certain forms of Seraphis, for example, um, and the way that we've designed Spark, would necessitate a change in the addressing format, which that's kind of a big ecosystem level change. You know, previous addresses would not be compatible, um, whereas you need new addresses that would be, you know, Spark compatible, for example. Right, so if I had, so existing Monero, Public, public addresses, but no longer function. Um, again, you know, a lot of this is like depending on how you might put a, a you know hypothetical protocol upgrade in place. Um, yes, you know, it'd be possible to to effectively um, you know transition existing assets to the new protocol, but that would have to use the new addressing format. Mm -hmm. you know, trying to trying to mix addressing formats and transaction formats would likely get very messy, and, and probably isn't the way to do it. You'd be, you'd be able to derive the new format from your existing private key. Um, you could do it from an existing seed, but you know, it's it's not it's it, for example, it's not possible for someone to just like look at a public address and magically make you know a new public address from that. Right. Um, it's, it's you can do all sorts of things with safe derivations of new addresses from seeds, but you know, it, we and again, like it's it's kind of a big ecosystem hassle, and you know, obviously, I'm sure folks would rather not switch addresses if they don't have to. Um, but in its current form, you know, the, a lot of the base changes that, that give the properties that we think are really nice in protocols like this just don't work with the old address scheme. Um, and again, like there's some other proposals that, that might, you know, have, um, have better compatibility, but I obviously can't speak to those in detail. So let, let's be clear on what, so we, we talked about the, the negatives there. Let's be clear. So then on what, what, what is all the potential upside here? In terms of in terms of Monero, if you guys don't mind uh, framing it, mm -hmm. I think you know, one of the most important thing will be the possible increase of the anonymity set size, right? Because Spark it will be more efficient in that uh, in the context than existing Ring City constructions, and that will help to scale the anonymity set size to up to one hundred twenty eight, for example. That's, this is one of the most important thing, and also it supports the, the very flexible uh, viewing key functionality. Actually, I'm not sure like uh, in which extent existing Ring City supports viewing key functionality. Does it support uh, both incoming and outgoing keys yeah. or delegation? 
Just incoming, yes. right? Yeah. Just incoming, right? Right, Aaron? Is uh, I don't want to I don't want to misspeak here. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so the existing um, kind of Ring CT based protocol with the addressing support that it has right now does support incoming view keys, which is useful for you know offloading the scanning of the chain, for example, um, and limited balance computation, but not outgoing view keys. Um, there's a lot of cases where you might want outgoing view key support to be able to determine you know when particular funds have been sent elsewhere without necessarily delegating access to spend them. Um, and what's nice is that this new address format and the way it's set up allows you to do that. So there's kind of like there's like three levels now of of key support. There is being able to do you know full spend authority, which lets you do everything. There is incoming view support, which kind of mirrors what exists now. And then there's this new outgoing um, or full view key. You know, that call it what you want. You know, I'm not particularly married to whatever terms are we use in the preprint right now. Um, but that would allow for um, identification of when funds leave. And that has a lot of good applications, right? I mean, it, it allows for, for more direct balance computation. Um, if, for example, you are um, part of like a, a multi-signature signing group um, that has like different thresholds open to it, you might want to know if another cohort uh, threshold of signers had authorized a transaction that you weren't part of. So mm. the nice thing is it allows for a lot of flexibility. And, the, and just auditing in general, right? So if you want to prove to somebody that you have a certain amount of Monero in a wallet, or you want to show your wallet, now Now you can actually show the amount of Monero going in and out of it as opposed to just going into the wallet. Um, yeah, and you know, again, there's there's ways you can kind of do, you know, limited inferred balance using incoming, incoming view keys, but, um, you know, previously you'd have to do signed key images and stuff, and that's kind of a pain. So, right. yeah, the nice thing is this gives you, I think, a lot more flexibility um, and lets you do things non-interactively. So, you know, I can just, if I want, I can hand someone the incoming view key or I can hand someone the outgoing uh, view key as well, um, you know, depending on the kind of the level of access that I want to, um, you know, provide that entity. So help me understand this a little deeper. So is it really, it's only touching the ring signature aspect of the protocol or are other elements of the protocol being touched by Loantis Spark? Yeah. Oh man. Okay. Um, it is. It is a pretty. It is a pretty different design. So um, you know, the idea is that is that assets um, in the protocol we just we call them call them coins. Calling everything an output, I found gets confusing. Outputs become inputs, become outputs. Um, so just uh, for the sake of, of the protocol, we call them coins. You can call them what you want. Uh, Zcash calls them notes. Monero and others would call them outputs. So they're still represented. Um, the value of it is still represented by Peterson commitment, which hides the value. Um, so that basically stays the same. Um, but the way that um, the way that the coin we call it the serial number commitment, um, which is kind of where the the key based material is baked in, um, the way that that's set up does change. Um, in particular, that's in part why you need these new address formats, um, is that they bake in more more key material. You might think of it. Um, and then to authorize these, um, so if scanning, for example, um, stays relatively the same. Um, so the, if, if you were to look at the math behind um, the way that Ring CT works now in terms of like generating coins or outputs, and you know how that works for Lilanta Spark, um, you can see that they're very similar. So identification works very similarly. Um, so scanning would operate very similarly. Where it really differs is how you end up doing um, authorizations. So previous ring CT approaches use this math that involved like certain commitments to zero, and you know we can use different signature types, ML SAG and CL SAG, or you could go to Triptych if you wanted to. Um, it's a little bit different here, where the um, the so-called one of many proofs um, that I guess in some way kind of take the place of of ring signatures. It's not a direct one-to-one -one correlation. Um, they, they end up changing a bit. Um, and then there's a final authorizing proof that's separate from those. Um, and this separation means that this, the so-called one of many proofs, where you kind of gather up all of these, these other elements of your input ambiguity set of other previous outputs or coins on the chain, um, those all get baked in together, but in a way that doesn't actually require the spend key. And that's kind of cool, because it means that you know, if, you, if you set up the math cleverly, and you're still working out exactly the best ways to do this, um, in a practical way, you could effectively have like another semi-trusted device 
compute those particular proofs. So for example, if I got like some dinky little hardware wallet that holds my spend key, you know, it can't do a whole lot. So if uh, I have this like massive, you know, gigantic one of many proofs sitting around, maybe it can't do that. So I can securely offload that to say a, a semi-trusted computer that, you know, I, I trust to have some access to some key material, but not the spend key. And it can form that proof. Um, and then the authorization that involves the spend keys happens in a separate, much simpler, almost Schnorr type proof. And that's something that we think that, you know, uh, low powered computational devices could probably handle. So effectively, like we have, we've kind of, we're kind of separating out where a different key material gets used um, in these one of many proofs and in these final authorizing proofs and things like that. And then balance is handled, um, balance can be handled very similarly to the way that it's handled in Ring CT. Um, for the, the sake of the security model that we have, we do it a little tiny bit differently, but it still involves range proofs um, and, you know, um, different properties of these value Peterson commitments. So the goal is to kind of try to make things modular in a way that, you know, gives you the flexibility around a key structure. Um, and it also happens to, to make multi-signature operations much nicer. Um, and so it's also nicely compatible with the idea of like delegating some expensive computations to more powerful devices without having to fully trust them with your spend key. Wow. So it's, this is a, a pretty major overhaul then. I mean, it's, it's, it's really changing all the internal guts of, not all, but it's... it's no, it's, I, would, I would say it's changing some of them in a way that makes them more modular. Um, I think also a little bit easier to reason about, too. Mm -hmm. You know, so being able to being able to kind of break apart some of these these components, I mean, makes it easier to build a, the security model that you might want around it um, and then reason about the protocol security. Mm -hmm. So real high level, I mean, so... An anonymity set gets larger, transactions get more efficient, correct? Right, they're smaller, uh, faster. Well, I mean, I mean, as the input set gets larger, the transactions don't get smaller. They still get larger. Um, right. I, 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 I should, well, what we can say is um, the scaling of transaction sizes is similar to that of, um, so the, uh, transaction size scaling between um, like Spark and between um, Seraphis, from what I've seen, and even off to like, if you were to do like triptych based transactions, um, they, they can be built using similar underlying components, these so-called one of many proofs. Um, these are also a version of which was also used previously in Atlantis too. Um, and they, they scale pretty well in size. So logarithmically in size, as we say. Um, so that scaling is very similar. There's some other specific elements of it. I talked about these authorizing proofs you have to, to kind of float along. Um, and there's some other transaction specific things that might, you know, differ a little bit between, you know, ways that you might implement protocols like this. Um, the downside, though, is still that verification time is, is kind of the sticking point. You know, um, I think we actually talked earlier on a previous episode about Triptych, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure I mentioned at that time that, you know, you can, you can try to be clever with how you do verification, and there's some batching that you can do. Um, but depending on the particular implementation, you know, you still kind of have these fundamental limits of how high this um, input ambiguity set size can get before, you know, you hit whatever wall you've set as being, you know, like the, the maximal verification you're willing to tolerate. So if, if transactions are allowed to have overlapping input ambiguity sets, you know, you can take advantage of that and make some better batching. Um, but it, a lot of this is like super implementation specific. And so just to simplify again so for, from the end user's perspective somebody that's you know using cake wallet or whatever um things will, will pretty much function the same they're not going to necessarily see a, a an increase in verification time like you said it's not going to be synchronizing the blockchain any faster necessarily uh but they're going to get more privacy with each transaction is it, is it fair to say those things? I think that it's fair to say that, you know, depending on, this is wishy-washy, you know, it, it, a lot of it depends on, like, the parameters you choose, like, how you, how you actually structure these input ambiguity sets, you know, things like that. Um, you know, scanning, like I said, still operates really similarly. So, you know, in theory, you know, depending on, um, and again, like, a lot of this depends on how big these ambiguity set sizes become, you know, because you have to verify transaction against those. And if you have to do all these lookups on a ton of these input elements, you know, that could potentially slow things down, too. Um, but, you know, if you chose, if, you know, if you chose your parameters correctly, 
you, know, you could see transactions that are probably of a comparable size. I would say probably a bit bigger, uh, just because we have these extra proof elements floating around. You know, not like 12 kilobytes bigger, like you know, old pre-bulletproof Monero transactions used to be. But you know, probably in the order of like I don't know. I'm, I'm totally spitballing here, um, but probably in the order of like between I don't know, two and a half to four kilobytes, maybe. You know, don't hold me to that number. I don't but, go to right. spend input. Yeah, if you had to make a huge rough estimate, like that's what you're probably looking at for, you know, transaction sizes um, and verification time, you could still make, you know, pretty darn good. So I, I think that you can make it have a good user experience, but again, you still have like this this kind of fundamental trade-off, wherein if you want bigger input ambiguity sets, which all other things being equal, you probably do. You know, you can try to choose them very carefully, of course, and that's you know a completely different topic to to discuss. But if you choose them well and you make them bigger, you know, you're going to have to pay for it in terms of a little bit transaction size, um, but more so in verification time. Got it, got it. Um, and do we, this, this 128 number, Aram, that you mentioned, uh, why, why is that the magic number? Why, why 128? Uh, I don't think that's a magic number, but I think that number was discussed uh, in the context of applying the Landos for Monero, right? Uh, that was a number that I've heard, or at least that I remember. Just because the average, because we think that's that's large enough to the point where it's it would and also that still keeps verification quite low. Well, I I mean initially when when you know, there was investigation into these one of many base protocols like Atlantis, mm -hmm. uh, you know, tripped to earlier. Mm -hmm. um, just as kind of like an, a fairly arbitrary baseline, um, I know is we some folks were interested to see you know how how big could that input ambiguity set get while not significantly increasing the verification time. You know, there's no law of the universe that says that you know you have to choose your parameters like that. You can make them whatever you want. Um, but that was just kind of a that was kind of a rough benchmark. Uh, and uh, and what, what is the out outcome of the benchmark like? Um, Keeping uh, the ambiguity set size for 128, the verification time will be comparable to existing Ring City. Yeah, and I, I'd have to go and check. I'd have to go and check the exact benchmarks, but I want to say it was around 64 to 128 um, mm -hmm. some example transaction types could probably make the. Yeah, I think that could probably make the verification time roughly comparable mm -hmm. um, to what it was with uh, CLSEG. Very cool, and then. So how far does that really get us in terms of anonymity? Are we then good for the foreseeable future, or is that something we'd eventually want to bump up again? I mean, I think a lot of that depends on your threat model. You know, um, there's a whole series of videos on uh, Breaking Monero um, and plenty of other ongoing research by you know other other folks who are interested in this too about like what you know what does it actually what does it actually mean. To have a, a certain input ambiguity set size, um, and you know how is that affected by the way that you choose those sets, and can we do binning to make you know better practical security? And it's it's such a big topic that I don't think that it's I don't think that it's suitable to say like this is the number that works. You know, like at some like granted, at some point you can probably get input ambiguity sets that are large enough that they're probably you know like practically indistinguishable from like full anonymity. I don't know what that cutoff is. <laughs> One twenty-eight. <laughs> uh, I mean, so I mean, I think I think that I think that that again is like a very separate process. Um, and I mean, in all the in all the papers that I've seen that introduce protocols like this that have these like specified ambiguity sets, um, you know, typically like how you choose them is like often not even discussed. It's like this is a totally separate thing that you should analyze carefully depending on your threat model. And you know how your protocol is set up and what your other limitations are. So you guys obviously know quite a bit about Firo as well, right? Given that this is essentially funded by by Firo, um, what is it going to look like for them when they when they implement Lolantis? Like, is it are they essentially getting the the same type of results, or it's a completely different animal over there? Mm, I think Fido is taking a bit different approach regarding to choosing the anonymity sets. So we are, uh, are using so-called the sliding window approach. When the ambiguity set is composed of, let's say, first 65k coins, and then it moves, it slides right 
when you kind of hit the limit. And that's how we aim to implement Spark for Firo. So you'd be able, the user would be able to essentially adjust the anonymity set? Is that what you're talking about? Kind of. Actually, when you spend, for example, the coin number, uh, number for 10,000, for example, then obviously it belongs to the first, um, first anonymity set. Mm -hmm. When the user wants to spend, let's say, 100,000 coin, then obviously it belongs to the second anonymity set. So each transaction kind of refers to the corresponding anonymity set, which is composed of this 65,000 elements. And just prove that he spends one of the 65,000 coins without revealing which one. That's the approach that we are discussing now to implement in Firo. Mm -hmm. Are there um, other... Go ahead. Uh, yeah, just an, just one more comment. And the advantage, uh, the, not, not the advantage, but uh, by using the sliding window approach, you, uh, you already can really leverage the page verification optimization techniques. So when the coins are spent from the same anonymity sets, all these transactions can be paged together and verified way more efficiently than they can be verified independently. Got it. Got it. Well, don't really got it. I mean, I don't know Firo that well. Um, is there anything else you could tell us about Firo that will kind of help us understand more why implementing Lilantis, Lilantis Spark? Uh, actually, I, 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 I couldn't hear the last 10 seconds. Can you repeat it, too? Is there anything else you could tell us about Firo that will help us like understand why it's moving towards the Lantis Spark. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. So how, why, why, why moving to Spark from Lelantus, right? So uh, Lelantus uh, provide anonymous spends of arbitrary amounts, but it lack one very important security feature, which was the recipient privacy. As it is used now, as it is implemented in Firo now, users can anonym, anonymously spend coins, but the recipient address is visible it's contained in the transaction. And this, this was a very major security drawback that we tried to solve during the last two years, basically. And Spark actually started from the research of resolving this issue. Yeah. And now Sparks provide like full security, anonymous balance security, and also recipient privacy. And it comes with all these nice features supporting multi six supporting all these flexible viewing key functionalities and also not compromising much on verification complexity compared to the original Lelandus design. This is also a very important aspect of it because initially we thought that we should compromise a bit uh, in order to get these extra security features. But the eventual, uh, the last design and uh, like early test shows that basically the verification will be approximately the same as in the original Lelantus. That's, that's, that's great, actually. Got it. So was, fear, um, was the Lelantus Spark, when you guys worked on it, or was it essentially designed with Firo, Firo in mind or Monero in mind? Or do you, you, it doesn't even work like that. It ha it's, you weren't really thinking about the, the end protocol. But if you could explain that a little bit, was it? I've designed it with Firo in mind. <laughs> Maybe the RNS is Monero in mind, but it actually doesn't matter because we kind of wanted to solve, the, uh, we wanted to design a privacy protocol for secure and flexible private payments. I yeah, I mean, understood that yeah, can I, be I, yeah, I mean, I, I, my, I, I guess I kind of internally had a goal of trying to make something that could be like more broadly applied. Um, you know, one thing, for example, that the original Volantis design did was um, it basically took the idea of like the spend authorization and the value, which in Monero, for example, those are kept separate. You know, there's they're basically um, output structures have like they have a component that you that kind of encodes the spend information, and then they have a separate component that encodes the value, and that gives a lot of flexibility and lets you do things like the ring CT structure that they have now, um, and Volantis. Uh, it basically kind of combined those into one structure, which, you know, in some sense is great because you can get, you know, you get some efficiency benefits from that, you can get some size benefits from it. But unfortunately, like, that proved to be really limiting 
when trying to do research into solving that recipient um, anonymity problem that Aron was talking about. Um, and so Spark basically, you know, goes back to the idea of separating out value from, you know, this, this spend authority component. Um, and I think what that also does is it makes, I guess, it, it can, it, I, I think the more I think about it, it can give you this nice compatibility with existing protocols like the Monero protocol, you know, which already has like these separate value commitments. Um, and, you know, I think if you were to go with something like Lelantis instead, for example, then you have kind of this additional kind of murky layer about, well, you know, Lelantis operates in one structure and the previous protocol operates in another structure and how would you bridge between them? And, you know, that can get a little bit murky. Um, but I think having a structure that, that works the way that this does gives you a lot more flexibility in, you know, like where you might be able to apply it. So, yeah, I mean, I hope that this idea is, is more broadly useful. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, it sounds like the Monero community is certainly leaning towards adopting it, right? Are you in on those conversations? Have you been following that at all? Um, I don't really know where folks stand right now. I'm not going to try to speak for anybody else. Um, and again, like I said, you know, I think that there was the, the original intent that I think a lot of folks had was to like continue with triptych research and you know, be able to take advantage of its scaling, which, like I said, is, is similar to that of like Spark um, and Seraphis. But you know, I think a lot of folks were were rightfully disappointed that you know, like multi-signature operations wouldn't work as efficiently as had been hoped. And that's just kind of a, it's it's part of the design, um, and it would have applied to other earlier designs too, like Omni Ring or Ring CT3. So you know. It is what it is, right? You know, it's it's different. Different different priorities exist, and those affect what protocols folks might want to go with. Um, and so, you know, when that kind of ended up stalling out a bit, um, you know, and then we had this interesting research into Spark, and like I said, there's um, this kind of separate parallel research into a similar protocol abstraction called Seraphis. And I think that gained a lot more interest, despite the fact that it might come with this trade-off of address and compatibility. You know, it's. Like always happens, like you can't get everything you want. It's like yeah. the, universe puts, the universe seems to put these fundamental mathematical limits in place sometimes. We're like, oh man, we have almost everything, except ah, now the addressing is more annoying. So, you know, hopefully that gets solved. Um, you know, I know that uh, I know that Co, who is the author of Seraphis, was looking at some designs that might be able to maintain address compatibility. Um, but I know that originally, at least, there were some questions on how some of the other structures would work, and I can't speak in detail about that. So I would say that I think that there's generally seems to be interest in in these kinds of designs because of their benefits relative to the drawbacks. It's, it's very cool that you guys are on the cutting edge there, pushing the limits. So how, how do you guys feel about this? I mean, personally, have you developed this proposal? Is it what you expected? Is it reaching your you know expectations when you started the project? Are you, are you happy with Lalanta Spark? Uh, I think, yeah, we both are very happy because, yeah, it's a new, completely new protocol coming with all these great usability features that far exceed at least uh, our initial expectation that we had in Firo, let's say, four months ago. Yeah, I think the, the part that I found the most interesting was, you know, being able to take this this fairly modular design and then think through, okay, you know, how could we, you know, implement this viewing key capability? Realizing, oh, it actually is like fairly straightforward to, to build in viewing key capability into the math. Mm -hmm. um, and then thinking, ah, but what about these really expensive proofs? If only we could, you know, delegate those away to, you know, uh, like a laptop, you know, and then be able to have the final part of the transaction be done on like a hardware wallet. And then it turns out, oh, there's ways to do that too. You know, that this protocol and the way it's set up and the way similar ones are set up kind of allow for this this really nice flexibility. And I think it was really cool to, to kind of figure out and work through how you could take these goals and and kind of build them into the protocol and build the protocol around them um, to get you... To get you Maybe the last thing uh, to add there, verification complexity. Actually, we, thought, we figured out that actually with a very simple mathematical tree, the initial estimate uh, can be improved almost to uh, 40 or 50%. And it was not very complicated, so that was another uh, great moment, getting getting us excited with the existing design. Yeah, and I think what's going to be really neat is to try to work some of these like optimization ideas into like a 
into it, into at least a test implementation that's more suitable for doing benchmarking. You know, so like I said, we worked up just kind of proof of concept code, but that's not really intended for benchmarking or secure mm -hmm. deployment. Um, just more so, you know, kind of test out the algebra, you know, uh, make it make it easier to show how these different parts of the protocol get instantiated in code. Uh, and I think from there, once we have that worked out, kind of figure out, you know, how we want these pieces to fit together, you know, then you can go to um, like a particular implementation that's more suitable for benchmarking. I think that's where you can start playing around to get these optimizations in place and then start to get some real numbers. Obviously, like until you get a real implementation, the best you can do is is you know kind of operation count estimates on verification, and those are always tricky. It's always tricky to say like, well, what would the actual verification time be? You know, it's you can only do estimates until you've actually built the thing. Do you think this is something you guys will continue to work on? Is there a lot more research? I know you mentioned it's it's obviously it's it's not done yet, so there's obviously some research that still needs to be done. But is oh, this yeah. A lot of it's very much ongoing. I mean, for example, you know, we put up the, the initial version of this preprint, um, and um, another researcher actually contacted the author of Seraphis. Like I said, Seraphis shares a lot, of, a lot of the same kind of design principles and modularity as Spark. Um, and you know, they, they were kind of came out of the, the same initial discussions. Um, and so the researcher had, had basically pointed out a flaw in the original design relating to these full view keys to the author of Seraphis. Then reported it uh, to us. So you know, we, we spent some time trying to do a, a bit of a redesign, uh, not of the whole uh, protocol, but um, of different parts of it, in order to solve that problem. So like this was very recent, like just over the past few days. So there's still a lot ongoing. You know, so I would not advise anyone to deploy this right now. You know, it's still very much in progress. Um, and you know, it turns out that there was part of the security model that we had didn't capture this particular uh, you know problem that had arisen. Um, that happened to do with like the interaction between um, between linking tags and and these full view keys. But as far as we know, um, the fix that um, that has been come up with solves it. Do you guys think there's a lot more innovation though that can take place within Atlanta Spark, or have, you know, in terms of once again increasing anonymity set, transaction sizes, confirmation times? I know you said we're just kind of hit a wall with co confirmation times, but these other elements and then maybe what, whatever else may happen, multi-sig even becoming more, essentially more user-friendly. Is there is there more innovation that you think can take place within Lalanta Spark to make it even better? Mm, hard to tell actually. We are uh, now focused just finishing the existing scope, uh, making sure that uh, all the security proofs are there and uh, also having better benchmarks on the performance, but who knows what will come next. Mm -hmm. And we are yeah. discussing some ideas to actually optimize multi six, right? At least uh, from the storage uh, st storage uh, point of view. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 a modular design, um, and one nice thing about that is that if you find more efficient modules to plug in, you can do that. So you know, these is one of many proofs which, like I said, they're kind of the thing that underlies Triptych and the original Volantis um, and um, one version of Seraphis and Spark um, and all these things. You know, those, those are where you really run into these limitations because that's where like this, the verification scaling in terms of input ambiguity sets comes into play. You know, so if, if it's determined that there's a more efficient way to do that component, you know, ideally and hopefully you can just kind of pull out the existing one of many proving system, put in a better one, and take advantage of whatever benefits that gives. So, you know, I hope that there's room for innovation here. And obviously, like, you know, this, this isn't the only way to do, um, you know, transaction protocols. It's just one way. I'm sure there could be other ones in the future, too. So why, why, uh, why Firo? Why, why is Firo the leading the way here? How, how did that happen? <laughs> a lot of people in Monero land would like to hear kind of the story behind that. Uh, if you guys want to talk about it. <laughs> so I'm working with Firo more than three years already. I am the creator of Lenatus protocol, actually, which probably inspired these other protocols as well, right? It was the first application of uh, one out of many proofs in the, not first application basically, but it has highlighted how useful uh, can this one out of many pros be and how actually we can optimize the verification with these batching techniques as well. So I'm working with Firo I'm more than three years and started the research. 
Uh, I was working on resolving this recipient privacy issue during the last two years. And uh, yeah, the, just Evan Arendt joined us and uh, also the idea of Lelanto Spark has came. We collaborated very efficiently and pro very productive way together to finish the whole, whole protocol. Yeah, and, and you know, Ron had been working on Atlantis and updates to it, um, and, and one initial idea that would provide a recipient privacy with a more kind of like, I guess, traditional Atlantis construction, um, we ended up finding some issues with the, the way that the security arguments worked on that, and I think that kind of led to the idea of, well, okay, maybe we have to take kind of a, a fundamentally different approach to the design, um, and that's where some initial discussions with others came, um, came to give the, the structure that we have now, so... You know, you try things, you know, work the way you want to, try new things. Yeah. Wait, I would love to mention that Aaron actually has played an instrumental role to provide feedback for Lelantus during the very first days of it. Like I remember when I first presented it in Berlin uh, and then I got an email from Sarang immediately right after the conference. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. After yeah. That, yeah, after that, I remember I saw, the I saw the paper and I saw one particular way that you were doing um, like combined proofs. I was confused. Yeah. And I wrote and I was like, how does this work? I'm confused. And then you told me about it. And then I was less confused. You, got, you guys are just uh, following your interests here. So it, it's nice to see. And it's um, leading to you know, evolutions in, in Monero. Uh, it's, it's nice to see projects working together as well. Um, that's a nice ecosystem that's going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I especially, yeah, I especially like that, that there's, that there's similar parallel work going on. Um, because analysis of similar designs in different ways, I think is a huge benefit. You know, so for example, there, there's a particular um, security model framework um, that we used for the preprint for Spark. And I know that this, that this other concurrent work, Serapis, um, is currently being looked at under a different security model, which is similar to the one used in OmniRing, which was a really cool previous uh, paper that came out. And you know, if we can take similar designs and show that they're secure using like different security model techniques, I think that that speaks to the strength of the design. So I, I like the idea that there's like, that there's like separate proving going on uh, with similar designs. I guess cool. How do you see the Monero community and the Furo community working in the, in the future? What do you what do you guys see the kind of the trend being between these two projects? Mm, I, I I'm not following much, but uh, my best hope is that these two communities will collaborate much closer together to better to, to better lead the progress in this privacy space. Yeah, I mean, collaboration is always a good thing. You know, like I said, there there was there was previous collaboration on on some improvements to the original Lulantis design, and I think that that's you know eventually worked toward leading to you know designs like Lulantis Spark. So I hope that there continues to be good collaboration. Yeah, and actually that was my vision from the beginning. That's how I did my best to like collaborate closely with Aaron and just work on this exciting new technology together. Do you guys think you'd be be doing any Monero funding requests through the CCS for Monero related work anytime? Mm, we are not discussing any anything at this moment. Okay. Come on, I'm trying, trying to get you back on. Uh, you know, get you guys over to Monero, working full time on Monero. Um, yeah, I mean that's yeah, I'm working with with CypherStack, which does contracting work um, for different projects, so. Who knows where that will lead? Okay. Okay. In terms of the the multi sig uh, improvements, mm -hmm. um, oh, man, like I'm I'm really happy about that. <laughs> you know, like like I had said, um, you know, one of the big uh, things that ended up being a drawback in Triptych, which I don't think was originally, you know, necessarily fully appreciated when it was being developed, was the fact that um, that multi signature operations become much more complicated and like i said that is what it is you know it, it was decided that that should be considered a higher priority um and there really wasn't a good solution to it that you know i think was as efficient as folks wanted but the design of these particular authorizing proofs in the lantus spark allow for you know pretty darn efficient multi-sig 
Yeah, it's, it's actually, for it actually. Yeah, it's it's actually it's very, very Schnorr like. It's very similar to a Schnorr proof. You can do a lot of similar things um, with like collaborative Schnorr type proofs in Spark. Yeah, we can refer to the term called Chom Pedersen proofs. That is, it's quite quite similar to Schnorr Schnorr ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So you know, it's it's there's there's been a lot of work that's been done on collaborative Schnorr type proofs for multi-sig operations. Um, you know, music was one approach where they thought they could do it with like two communication rounds between players back and forth. Turns out they couldn't. That was uh, shown to be insecure, so they added a third one. Um, there's been some work from the Zcash Foundation re Foundation's researchers on on different ways that you can do two round Schnorr. Um, they require some some pre computation rounds, and there's been there's been other research in that area too. Um, and I think the, I think you can get away with the standard three round approach. Um, with these John Peterson proofs, and maybe some of these other optimizations that others have found to do two rounds could work too. But um, you know, that's that's a bit of a ways off. The nice thing is that those are not consensus related. So you know, ideally, we want multi-signature transactions and addresses to work and operate identically from any others. So mm -hmm. that inherently makes them non-consensus related, which means that if you can find improvements later on, you can just do it. Any thoughts on how? This could potentially affect the ability to build a, a layer two on top of Firo or Monero. Hmm. I mean, that would really depend on the particular applications. And like, I'm I'm, not, I'm no expert in like some of the more modern approaches to that. But you know, my understanding um, is that there are some techniques that have pre that would have pretty minimal requirements on like the Monero or Firo side versus something like a Bitcoin side, where there's you know a bit more, um, I guess, expressibility in terms of uh, things like scripting and, and lock times and stuff like that. And the requirements on like the other side, as far as I know, just requires some particular multi-signature operations. So, you know, I don't know, it sounds like folks are looking to efficient multi-sig and, <laughs> you know, I are discussing calls to make that as straightforward as possible. Are you discussing implementing? Uh, have, it, have been there any discussions about implementing layer two solutions for Monero? I think just in, in very general, futuristic terms. Mm. I I don't know if anybody's seriously discussing it. Do you know, Aaron? Um, I and I haven't I haven't kept up on that and that as much. So you know, early work had looked at um, you know enabling things like payment channel networks and refund transaction type operations. You know, the, the, there was a paper called DLSAG that some other researchers came up with that we collaborated on that intended to do that, but it turned out that there was a security issue that would have prevented it from being used in practice. Um, and then my understanding is that some other approaches to, um, to swap type operations and those protocols, you know, didn't require those particular constructions anymore and just needed, you know, multi-signature on one side and some other things on, on the other side. And again, like I can't speak to the security of those because I'm not really an expert in that. But um, you know, it's, it sounds like that there's been a lot of advancement there, and you know, being able to do efficient multi-signature operations um, would be important for it. But you should talk to folks who do research in those protocols, <laughs> not me. How about uh, Fira? Are, are they ever, you know, looking to build the layer two or? They're not really thinking along those lines. They want everything on layer one. What's the what's the long term vision for Fira? Hmm. Uh, building layer two application definitely doesn't fit into our midterm plans. Uh, we are building Elysium, which enables to create arbitrary assets on top of Fira, and Elysium also supports Lelandus, so you can trade assets anonymously. And I believe after upgrading to Spark, that can, that will be implemented to Elysium as well. But uh, I don't remember any particular deep discussion about implementing layer two solutions on, for Fira. Okay. How would you how would you really describe the differences between you, you know for the end user or between Monero and Fira? Mm. Adam, please. Betty. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very different approaches, right? Um, you know, Firo, and again, like, I, I can't speak um, much to, like, the goals of it particularly, but, um, you know, it started out as Zcoin, uh, which is based on a particular zero coin 
protocol, um, which turned out unfortunately to have um, to have a flaw with it. Oh. Very unfortunate. Um, but that approach was kind of a simple like um, mint and redeem operation where you couldn't do direct anonymous payments. You know, you could basically yeah. just kind of kind of build this this anonymity pool and then pull stuff back out to a base chain. Um, and um, you know, it seems like that's kind of been eventually slowly moving toward the idea of um, you know this this optional um, kind of anonymity type pool with the Lantis protocols. Yeah. So now it takes a different approach. Obviously, where like there is effectively no transparent layer. Um, you know, the goal there being to avoid you know transitions um, and you know avoid issues that can arise with you know having transparent operations. So you know. There are those who argue that having, you know, optional transparency can benefit the ecosystem. I think that there's a lot of risk in that. Um, I think it'd be nice to, to make transactions, you know, uniform, indistinguishable, you know, hopefully all safe. Um, but, you know, I think the goal is to make that efficient enough that folks will, will want to use that at a protocol level. I think Monero's design haven't changed much during the last few years, right? While Firo has iterated over three protocols already. Because as Aaron mentioned, the initial, uh, the original zero coin protocol has been broken. And then we moved to the similar protocol, which was already based on one out of many proofs. But that protocol, we refer to Sigma. Sigma still allowed only to do anonymous spends, mint, uh, like mint and redeem operations. So uh, of, fixed, uh, of coins of fixed amounts. So you cannot, uh, you couldn't even transfer coins of arbitrary amounts. You could and uh, much less it lacked recipient privacy. And then we looked, uh, we, there was a period when we were thinking about implementing some ZK, ZK, similar to ZK approach, we were uh, looking at circuit based approaches and we were thinking how we can implement ZK SNARKs uh, similar approach with bullet proofs. And then we figured out that it will not be practical. It's far from being practical. And then no, the idea of Lantus is... <laughs> Tell it again, Alan. Yeah, board proofs do not scale well for... Yeah. yeah. Then we came to this idea of, uh, oh, wait, we can extend the coin structure to embed arbitrary values to it. And also this one out of many proofs are great because we can do patch verification and it will be easy to build balance proofs there. And that is, uh, this became the first version of Lelantus, which lacked recipient privacy. Mm -hmm. Then it took more than two years to fix it. It sparks. And yeah, I think you have a few more reserved names, names for the future upgrades of this product, right? Yeah, who knows? Naming's hard. Now, I mean, I think, I think that the different protocols, like the Monero protocol and then what Fear is doing with their protocols, you know, like they have different trade offs, they have different assumptions, they have different requirements, and so. You know, it's, I mean, I think it's easy to, to look at one or the other and say like, ah, why does this have one feature and the other one doesn't? But you know, a lot of times like there's, there's practical reasons for it or there's ecosystem reasons for it. Um, or, you know, there's ideas about how quickly protocol should upgrade versus how stable they should be. Um, I mean, I think that that's been kind of an ongoing discussion with like Bitcoin's protocols, for example. You know, they tend to be pretty stable over time, but you could say that that also can end up limiting, you know, the ways that people can iterate and add new features onto them. So it gets tricky. Definitely tricky. How how big is the ecosystem of, of guys like you that are capable of doing this type of cryptogra cryptography? Is it? I imagine it's a pretty small world. It's well, like there's plenty, plenty of people working in, in industry and academia on this stuff. I guess I don't really have a good feel for you know how many folks do cryptography like that. And is there a network where you guys are connected and talking? Obviously, you guys are submitting these research papers. Is there um, a network where you guys are all communicating? There are a few people that we can exchange and share some feedbacks together. But that's not a great a big community, not a big network, at least for me. Not sure about Aaron's network. I, mean, I, I try to keep in touch with with folks who are interested in this but you know i think a lot of it is that everyone kind of works on different areas of interest and then you know some folks end up working on on their research like more on their own or like with their research groups and every once in a while you see these crazy 
cool papers come out, you're like, wow, where did that come from? <laughs> and then there's all this money to talk about with the authors. What, what I find so fascinating and what I admire about you guys is, well, one, obviously this is extremely, you know, only certain people are capable of doing this, right? You need to be born with those type of brains. Uh, but just this this idea that uh, you guys are really seemingly more more interested in you know interested in in the math and trying to solve a problem using the math and the, the cryptography, and really not so much interested in the coin that may eventually use it, uh, which I think is. Uh, you know, it's it's a good quality to have, and it's nice to see. And you think that is that a fair assessment of of people like you that are working on these things? Is it that you care more about uh, the math and trying to solve the problem so more than the actual project that may end up implementing it? No, well, it's pretty much accurate. Uh, I definitely care most about solving the problem. I care more about solving the problem more than I care about the math. <laughs> but of course, uh, after solving it, 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 it it's still important. Like uh, which coin, not which coin, but it's still important that uh, it helps your company that you are working with to move further to take it to the next level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's important for me. Right, you want to see it actually being used in the real world. Sorry, you want to actually see it come to fruition for a real project. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that there's also a balance to be had between, you know, kind of an idealized solution and then, you know, how how that idealized solution would kind of run into brick walls in the real world. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, for example, things like efficient multisig. You know, in principle, you're like, ah, look at this, look at this protocol over here. It it works, but oh, it turns out that if you were to try to actually do multi you know, multi-sig operations, it would be really inconvenient. And so like, that's kind of a brick wall you hit, and then that necessitates making changes. And, you know, having things like new capability, both, I think, solves a cool problem, um, but also kind of, of, you know, solves real-world problems that folks might have, too, with the way that, you know, their devices interact or the way that they delegate key access. Um, you know, and then computational limits, you know, uh, can lead to, to, I think, new problems that we have to solve about delegating expensive proving operations. You know, so I think on one hand, if you just try to solve like this idealized version of a problem, um, you know, you can probably do it, but it might not be that useful in practice. And so I think having a good understanding of of how folks might need to use this in practice, you know, is important to kind of guide design decisions. What are some of the other projects that cryptographers are excited about? You know, people that are are in your circles. You know, projects that they think are kind of on the cutting edge? I think there are many projects. There are many super interesting projects now evolving in blockchain space because this is super fast growing space, right? And we see more and more very interesting application applications. Secure <laughs> self sovereign for example, self sovereign identities becomes a very interesting space mm -hmm. to research for. Security tokens, how to provide uh, private transactions on uh, account based model, for example, on Ethereum like blockchains, which, uh, which operates on user accounts, not on UTXOs. There are so many very interesting projects. The self sovereign identity, you want to explain yeah. that? Yeah, it's identity managed by the user. So you are self-control of your identity. And uh, for example, you can get certificate that uh, you are an adult. And then you can use that identity to buy an alcohol without revealing your actual age, just proving that you are an adult. For example, and be in full control of, of uh, who has access to your data and how you use it. So like using a zero knowledge proof. Yeah, yeah, again, it's powered by zero knowledge proofs mm -hmm. and also powered by blockchain. So your identity can be verified publicly. Do you see things like that being built into things like Furo or Monero or being, uh, mm. or are there their own separate projects? I don't see any, any obvious link between these two different concepts. 
because uh, like Firo and Bob Monero, they already provide anonym anonymity, right? And um, I don't know, actually, maybe in the future, we can see how integration of these two different technologies can help to create better and more usable systems. But I don't have any particular idea at this moment. How about just uh, communication in general? You know, people every once in a while you hear talk in the Monero community. I, I've made mention of it uh, when I, in my earlier days with Monero, just this idea of maybe eventually using it as a communication system as opposed to just a system that's communicating value, uh, but also a system that's communicating more information beyond value. Um, do you ever have any thoughts there on, on things like that? Uh, do you mean just using it as a secure messaging? Uh, uh, yeah, secure messaging, maybe a marketplace itself gets built on top of the protocol. I mean, there's all types of things you could imagine, you know, if this mm. becomes a base layer. I'm just curious if you ever think along those type of lines or if it's just digital cash. Uh, I didn't. I didn't actually. Not sure if this is the most efficient design for secure messaging in general. But definitely, it can be used to power bigger systems, to power secure marketplace. Eric, what are your thoughts, Sarah? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, your thoughts on that, and I guess the general question as well, which you know, um, things we're really excited about in the field. Yeah, like I, like I, I'm interested in in things that can scale better. You know, like specified um, input ambiguity sets are like a big limiting factor. And, you know, we can make them scale better, you know, like things like, like Cryptic and Spark and Seraphis, they scale a lot better than like previous approaches to specified ambiguity sets like MLSAG and CLSAG, but like they're still very limiting. Um, and like, I think seeing where research is going toward removing that limitation is really interesting. Um, you know, like that's, that's something that like Zcash started with like the Sprout and Sapling protocols, um, you know, those had their own limitations, um, as we know regarding trust and, you know, regarding some of the initial functionality that they had um, and efficiency and, you know, whether or not those protocols are, you know, mandatory against the base chain or not. Um, so I think that, you know, being able to get good scaling with like full input ambiguity sets, like that's really interesting. Um, you know, like I know that they're, that they're working to remove that with like an upcoming update orchard. Um, but, you know, I, I, I've been following it from time to time, and so I'm not really up to date on it. Um, and I don't really know what the benchmarks are on it. But you know, if if that's like an approach that's going to work, uh, Aaron, you want to you want to finish up where we lost you? I'm in the of, uh, answering the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I think I think that in general, what's going to be interesting is to see you know where like current and ongoing research takes us. You know, in terms of being able to scale well with, you know, large or full input ambiguity sets, and you know, different projects are working on that in different ways. And I know that's like the ability to do, you know, general well scaling uh, proofs and you know proving systems in a way that doesn't require trust, which has like traditionally been kind of like a big sticking point. You know that research is is like very active and very cool, mm -hmm. and you know having having like bespoke proving systems like like Spark uses um, can get you some efficiency, but you know being able to have like very general like circuit based proving systems that scale well, you know, is is probably going to have to be you know where where this ends up going. Very cool. And so, do you think we'll? see new projects evolve to try to do those things or they will be integrated into existing projects in like cryptos cryptocurrencies i mean uh, who knows <laughs> i think the, the map is interesting well, like where people, where people take it and implement it i think has yet to be determined you know it's my understanding that there are projects that are that are doing that are doing work in that area um but you know future is hard to see and which leads to my last question which is kind of similar. We have, there's a lot of projects right now. There's a lot of cryptocurrencies. There's a lot of even just 
privacy coins within cryptocurrencies. Do you see there uh, it's staying that way for quite some time, or there being a consolidation that's going to take place? Hmm. Uh, in my opinion, actually, my best hope is that in the future we will see more usage of privacy cryptocurrencies. And in my opinion, that is the most important thing. And after having that market growing, um, again, I hope that there will be more than one privacy coins. And I believe that there will be more than one privacy coins, although they, it can happen that there will be some consolidations or I believe some projects may die and some will thrive. But... Uh, Definitely, there will be more than one privacy coins and they can serve different niches of the market or they can serve different use cases, probably. It's hard to say because uh, definitely there will be pros and cons and trade-offs between different cryptocurrencies. Either they can provide different security guarantees or they can provide different usability features. So the most important thing is first seeing this market growing and seeing many people, more and more people using privacy coins and not just using them for speculations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually using it. Yeah. Aaron, what do you, what do you think there? No, I, I, yeah, I think that having a broad and diverse ecosystem that, you know, makes different trade-offs, which is what happens now, and, you know, addressing different use cases, which is what happens now, and solves different problems, which is what happens now, is important and valuable. You know, like I don't think that this is a zero sum game. I think that like Aram was, was getting at, you know, having having a good ecosystem around privacy and safety and security will I think encourage people and like build out good use cases and and I think that that also will help to like encourage and drive research as well. You know, research takes a whole lot of different paths. And I think that that's useful and important in math and science, and it always has been. Um, and I think that the more that different kinds of researchers are encouraged to do different kinds of research, like the better the results end up being. All right. Mm -hmm. There you have it, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, I guess if you want to let us know where people can find you, continue to follow you on updates as you guys work on Lalanta Spark and just follow you in general. You so can people can... Yeah, people can email me at aram at firat.org and for following to the Spark updates or progress in this uh, in our research, they can follow to maybe official Twitter account of Firo or maybe Aaron because I'm not very active on social media. Okay. Ah, uh, never mind. But I mean, if you're really into cryptography and preprints that come out, you know. The, the preprint for Spark, which is uh, the one that's always kept up to date, um, is on the IACR reprint archive. And if you are a photographer. Yeah, I guess, <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, I don't know. I, that's where the math goes. So if you like math, you can go there too. All right, gentlemen. Thank you so much. I think it's ex obviously very exciting. It's very exciting to see these developments. Uh, thank you for your hard work and your innovation. Um, and yeah, let's, let's keep in touch. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Keep in touch. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.